Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. We believe that God's Word has the power to change lives. So grab a pen and paper and get ready for this message. So as I said this morning, in just in my daily devotion, I felt like God uh, began to speak some things to me. And this is a passage that, that God has spoke to me before about circumstances that were in my life. And, you know, when you read Scripture, uh, there is the written word, which is what is written on the page. That's what the original writer meant for the original uh, reader and you know the basic applications of what that meant you know a lot of the letters that Paul wrote were written to specific churches or specific individuals that were instructions to them that we can gain secondary applications and things from and and that's the the written word but there's also a thing called the rhema word and the rhema word is when God will use a passage of scripture to speak something to you about a circumstance that's in your life, a, a situation that will give you direction, uh, you know, some type of insight uh, directly to you. Many of you probably have uh, been reading your Bible before and it's like something just jumps off the page or you're asking God a question and, and like these scriptures just come to your mind or in your daily devotion. Anybody ever experienced that before where you feel like God just literally highlighted in your Bible right there is the answer. And, and, and John 11 is a passage and it's a familiar story uh, that many of us know it's the story of Lazarus but uh, the, in John 11 verse 2 there's a, a thing where they tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick and then Jesus says you know it's okay this sickness will not end in death but it will bring glory to God and I remember when uh, Zia was younger, we were seeing St. Jude. She had a, a bone marrow deficiency. They, they weren't able to pinpoint what was going on. We had been to St. Jude in Memphis. We had seen uh, doctors from all over the world were studying her case, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Every time they thought that they had it figured out, then she kind of threw them a curveball. And, you know, there, it, it's kind of tough as a parent when you go to Memphis and you're seeing uh, doctors that this is the, these are the top doctors in the world at St. Jude uh, in the field of, of hematology and oncology. And, and one of the doctors came out to us and she had been there for 30 years. And so this isn't like a rookie doctor or anything like that. This is the best of the best doctors who has been there for 30 years. And she just comes out to us and says, look, we have no idea what's going on. We have never seen a case like this before. We don't know how to fix it. We don't know how to treat it. Because, you know, some of the treatments that they could give could actually cause cancer. You know, there, there's all these different variables. And, and so you're like, yeah, thanks for that. You know, just want to have a little bit of hope. And then your doctors that you see that we were seeing, they told us that 90% of children who have the type of deficiency that she had never make it to be one years old. And that, this, that if they make it to be more than one, that they would have to have bone marrow transfusions or basically live in a bubble for the rest of their life. How I many you know that's not a good report? And that's what all the doctor's reports were saying. And I remember just praying and asking God, God, you have to give me something. You have to give me something to stand on because all I'm getting is negative things. And, and I opened up my Bible and, and it was John 11 and then verse 2 said this, this sickness would not end in death, but it will bring glory to God. And, and here's the thing, Zia now is 13 years old, she is in perfect health, the doctors are hopefully optimistic that she is in some type of remission, but how many of you know Jesus healed her completely? But every time that the results came back negative, every time we had a bone marrow biopsy that looked worse and, and all of this, and I remember one night in particular that that uh, she had, they had tried to do a pick line in her arm because her veins were so 
worn out from, from all the, the IVs and everything that she had to have. And, and they tried to do a pick line, and so they had to intubate her to put her under to do the pick line. The pick line failed, so it was kind of a bust there as far as that goes. But when they had pulled the intubator out, the tube out, they scratched her throat, and she had no immune system, so her body just kind of overreacted a little bit. And so it was, her, her throat began to swell up, and she could barely breathe. And I remember this night, we're in the hospital, and, and like every breath, as a parent, you hear them struggling, and then you don't hear breath. You jump up, and you run over to the crib, and you're like looking to make sure they're alive and all of this. And I tell you, that night, earlier that day, I had just read the story of Elijah who went in and the, the little boy had died, and Elijah stretched himself upon the dead body three times and brought him back to life. And I literally thought at that point, okay, God said this sickness isn't going to end in death, but it's going to bring glory to God. And I read this morning that Elijah raised the little boy from the dead. So if she dies, I'm raising her from the dead tonight. I mean, that was the type of thing, like, that was the type of thing that I had because I felt like God was just giving me hope and giving me direction and everything that there was something better. And you know, when we have a weekend and we call it revive weekend we've had some people ask is that just like his neat name for revival or you know that type of thing and and I know a lot of times we schedule out these events and we call it revival and we bring in guest speakers and and hope that people are going to get fired up and everything but the problem with most of those revivals are people encounter God in an emotional way it lasts for a couple weeks and then it fades right off the map and I don't believe, like, we didn't call it revival not just because we were trying to be cute and different. We called it revive because what I feel like God wants to do is I believe there are churches that are dead that God wants to bring to life. I believe there are marriages that are dying that God wants to bring to life. I believe that there is hope and, and purpose and ministry that are in people's heart that God wants to bring to life. The dreams that it seem like they've been dormant, that God wants to speak something into their life and begin to thrust us not into a weak revival or a two-week revival, but a movement that would literally change our state and our nation and that's why I don't want you to come just to hear a message or whatever guys we need to be praying we need to be fasting we need to believe that God has something greater for this weekend that this is just the start that this is just the, the initial boost this is just the thing to get things rolling in the direction that it's been that, that he desires it for it to be and this morning when I read this passage, I felt like God was speaking things to me and I just began to journal it and write it down and really tonight the message isn't, you know, finally put together or anything. This is just what I wrote down in my journal. I'm just kind of sharing some of the notes that I feel like God spoke to me as I wrote out what, what I feel like He wants to do in our area. So if you have your Bibles, open up to John 11 and we're going to be there all night long. We're, we're not going anywhere else. We're staying right in John 11 because that was my devotion for today was to read John 11. So I did it and, and got to hear from God and everything. And now I get to share it with you. So let's pick up verse 3. It says that the sisters sent word to Jesus. And they said, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. But it will bring glory to God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. These were people that were connected to him. He had a personal relationship with. And I think that's an important uh, uh, phrase that, that is in here that the Holy Spirit wanted us to realize. And it says Jesus loved them. So when he heard that he was sick, he ran immediately to be right there bedside and hold his hand and... Raise him up. Is that what it says? That's what we would do, right? We hear somebody that we love is sick. The first thing we're going to do is run there to be there to be with them. And, and, and that's our automatic response because uh, by, by us being there, you know, things are going to change. You know, I mean, we, we want to be able to, to minister or whatever it is. But here, Jesus... The people that he loves, he finds out one of them is sick. 
And it says that he stayed there for two days longer. Come on, that just seems kind of wrong. Like, it almost seems like Jesus doesn't care. Like, hey, Jesus, you've came to my house and you've ate at my house, you fellowship with my house. In fact, verse 1 says that this is the Mary who washed Jesus' feet and, and anointed Jesus' feet. This is somebody that he had a close relationship with. And they say, hey, Jesus, I want you to come. My brother is sick. And he's just like, yeah, it's not going in death. See you in a couple days. I mean, we would think the natural response is you got to move now, you got to move now. I mean, when we see that, that's exactly what we would do. We would run to try to minister to the, the person that is hurting. But Jesus sits back and he doesn't run into action. He continues to do what God called him to do for that season and be where God called him to be for those days. And then after that, in verse 11, it says, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He said, but, but I need to go now so that I may awaken him out of sleep. Now look at this, it says, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's asleep, he will recover. But now Jesus was not speaking about sleep. He was speaking about death. But they thought he was talking about literal sleep. Jesus waited until Lazarus died before he ever moved in that action. Now, I know there's probably some people in here that you look at the circumstances, the situation that's going on in your life, and it looks like it is hanging on by a thread, like it is on life support. And, and Jesus, you got to move now. Yeah, I, I sent the word now. Why aren't you coming now? And, and even some people, they're starting to get frustrated and they're starting to get angry with God because they think that they should be now. I, I know when you think about this, if you are Mary and Martha, you are one who the Bible says that Jesus loved them and, and you send word hey my brother's sick you don't want him waiting until he's dead and that's exactly what Jesus did but I think there's a couple things that we need to pull out and that we can understand from this and the first one is this is that Jesus views things through an eternal perspective because Jesus said hey he, he's asleep I gotta go wake him up but in our earthly mind, he was not asleep. He was dead. But if you even look at other places, you remember when Jesus was going with Jairus to heal his daughter? And all the people ran out and they said, it, don't bother him any longer. It's too late. She's already dead. It's hopeless. There's, there's no way. You, you can go on about your way, Jesus. The daughter's already died. It's too late. And Jesus is just like, she ain't dead. She's asleep. Why does Jesus look through the thing and see sleep when everybody else sees death? Because in God's view and mind, when we die here, our spirit goes to be with God in heaven, and those people who know him live eternally. But the people who don't know him are thrown into the lake of fire, which is what? The second death. See, the first death to Jesus is just sleep. Because he is not bound by our time. He is not bound by our limitations. For him, it's no different than just going and trying to wake up your child from a nap. Because he views it from an eternal perspective, not a short-term perspective. We have to realize also that what God, that what we see as dead, God just sees it as sleep. Nothing is final until God says it's fine. Your marriage is not over until God says it's over. 
your health situation is not over until God says it is over. We had every doctor's report that, that we had given us no hope, no chance, no nothing that, she was, that Zia was going to be able to live and be able to make it. And I think it's very interesting that we'll have like the plague go through our house and Zia will be the one person who doesn't get sick. And I'll tell you this, the enemy will try to bring fear and everything right back into your life if you allow him to. I remember this one appointment that we go and we're going for a checkup and everything and so they're running CBCs and ANAs and all these different blood tests and everything that they were doing and they said listen if everything's normal we're just going to send you home if there's any abnormalities or anything's wrong we're going to put you in a room and we're going to have the doctor come in and talk with you and so we wait you know and they, they go run the labs and next thing you know the nurse comes in and was like hey we need you to come over in here in the room and the doctor's going to be with you here in a few minutes. And we're like, what? what? No, 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 no. She's healed. What, you know? And we're kind of going through this in our minds and what's going on. And you know, God said, God told us she's healed. He's, he's healing her. And next thing you know, the doctor peeks their head in and is like, I'm so sorry about that. The abnormality was her neutrophil count was way too high. So you can go on home. Everything's fine. In other words, her immune system was overworking and doing exactly what it was supposed to do. There's tons of people who have tried to put death sentences on different things in our life. But when God, what man calls dead a lot of times... God simply calls sleep, and God has a way of waking it up. And so you don't give up on your marriage, you don't give up on your health, you don't give up on your finances, you don't give up on your dream, you don't give up on those things until God says so. He doesn't always move when we think He should, but we can rest assured that when we cry out to Him, that He does answer us. See, Jesus didn't get up and run to Bethany, which is where Mary and Martha lived. He waited a couple more days, and then he decided, he was like, okay, guys, it's time to go. And he starts heading toward their house, and Martha hears that Jesus is coming toward their house, and in verse 21, she runs out to meet him, and she says, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, if you would have came when we called you the first time, Jesus, if you would have just came when I asked the first time, he wouldn't have died. Lazarus would still be here if you would have just put a priority on what's going on in my life right now. Everything would be fine. Don't you realize, Jesus, that you're too late now? And then she kind of catches herself a little bit and, and she says, but, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, that God will give it to you. And Jesus looks at her and said, your brother will rise again. Come on, somebody. I mean, can, can you imagine like you lost your child, you lost your brother, you lost a close relative. They're in the grave. They've been in the grave for four days. And the Son of God shows up and says, hey, they're going to rise again. Like, you would at that moment have some hope. You would at that moment have some type of an anticipation of, uh, uh, of you know, that, 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 that he's going to be able to move and, in their life. But, but look at what, what she replies. It says, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Did Jesus say that she was, he was going to rise again in the resurrection? He said, no, your brother's going to rise again. You know what she's doing? She almost made a religious statement out of it. Well, yes, Lord, I know that one day he's going to rise. When, when, when the, the trumpet sounds, <laughs> the clouds will part. The dead in Christ will rise. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bless his name. I'll fly away, oh glory. 
Come on, I mean. Look, we do the same thing. God speaks, I'm going to bring healing into your life. Yes, I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a new body. Yes, on the other side in glory, everything's going to be good. I'm going to dance on the streets of gold. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't say he was going to heal you in heaven. He said he's going to heal you now. I believe there are people that God has spoken a word of healing in your life and you've said, yes, when I get to heaven, God says it's not when you get to heaven, it's now. I am able to heal you now. I have a plan and I have a purpose and I need you healthy, I need you whole. It is my desire that you prosper in health even as your soul prospers. So start letting your soul prosper. Start getting in the Word. Start worshiping God. Start feeding the Spirit and standing on the Word of God versus the Word of every other doctor or negative Nelly that you come across. And here, here's the, stop being religious about all of it. Jesus wasn't talking about the resurrection. He was talking about what He was getting ready to do. And that's the thing we have to realize. Jesus knew that he could raise the dead. So he was not stressed about the moment. Again, to him, he's just going to go wake somebody up. What we see as death, Jesus sees as sleep. Verse 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he looks at her and says, do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection? Do you believe that, that I am the life? I believe that for many people that are in this room, and you're looking at a marriage that stinks, you're looking at finances that are horrible. You're looking at doctor's reports that aren't great. Jesus is asking, do you believe that I am the resurrection? I am the life. And then no matter how dead it looks, I can bring it back to what it's supposed to be. goes on in verse 27 it says she said to him yes Lord I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God he who comes into the world then it goes on and it says that Mary hears that Jesus is, is in the area and that that Jesus is coming and so she runs out and she meets him and it says therefore Mary came where Jesus was and and she saw him and she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had just been here. Can you imagine the anguish? Because here's the thing. She not only felt the grief from losing her brother, but she felt the rejection from Jesus not moving the way that she thought. And I, and I love this thing. Martha comes and talks to her and says, hey, if you would have been here, Mary falls back at his feet. What was the very first phrase in verse 1 that I told you? It says, Mary, this is the Mary who what? Washed the feet of Jesus. She goes back to the position of serving, the position of honor, the position of worship says, God, if you'd been here, Jesus, if, if you would have just showed up when we sent the first word, then my brother wouldn't have died. And it says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came also were weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit, and he was troubled. I'm telling you, Jesus wasn't troubled because he didn't know how the situation was going to end. 
the fact that in her pain, she still positioned herself at the feet of Jesus in worship. Moved him so much that verse 35 says that Jesus wept. And it says that the people who were around said, look, he really loved him. That's why he's weeping. No, Jesus wasn't weeping because of his love and, and because he was mourning that Lazarus was dying. Jesus was weeping because his heart was touched by a woman who was broken and hurting and grieving, falling at his feet and continuing to worship him. Even though in her worship, she was questioning him. He was okay with it. Because he came and she came and fell at his feet. It says the ex exact same thing. If you, if you would have been here. You see, Mary and Martha knew that Jesus was a miracle worker. They had seen him work miracles. They had seen him do amazing things. But this was different because one... It was a personal thing. See, sometimes it's easy to believe for other people's miracle, but it's very hard for you to believe for your own. You can believe that God can heal somebody else, but a lot of times we don't believe that God would do it for us. We can believe that God can restore somebody else's marriages, but we don't believe that he'll do it for us. We can believe that God will provide for other people, but we don't believe that he'll do it for us. Can I tell you something? If you are his son or his daughter, he'll do it for you. And you know what? A lot of times he even does it for people who aren't walking with him he still provides and heal come on how many of you god did something for you in your life before you got saved why are you still a heathen he still moved in your life but the other problem was death is final to them there's nothing worse than death of course today if you say what's your greatest fear Death is number two on greatest fears. Number one is public speaking. <laughs> so most people would rather die than get up here and have to speak to you. <laughs> but it, it, it just seems like it's over. There's, there's no hope at that moment. If only you'd come sooner than... You could have worked a miracle. You could have brought healing. But now things are too far gone. It's, it's over. It's hopeless. And that's exactly what some of you feel. I'm too far gone. I've messed up too much. I've, I've ruined everything. I, I've ruined my marriage. I've ruined this. I've, it, it, I've messed it up. It's hopeless. And Jesus didn't let that bother them. See, a lot of times we'll sit there and say, well, if you, if you had enough faith, then Jesus would heal you. Here, they didn't say any faith-filled words, really. I mean, they said, oh, yeah, I know God can give it to you, but he's dead. Where were you? I mean, that, that's, that's the thing. It's not like, oh, I believe that you were raised. It's, it's not even, I believe you raised him from the dead right now. It's, well, one day in glory, you can do it. But Jesus isn't moved by that. And in fact, in verse 39, it says, Jesus looked at him and he said, hey, remove the stone. And Martha said, Lord, by now, there's a stench. He has been in the grave and dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you? That if you would believe, that you would see the glory of God. I believe for some of you tonight, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Didn't I tell you that if you would obey me, I would move on your behalf? Didn't I tell you if you would submit, that I would exalt you? Didn't I tell you that if you would humble yourself, that I would fight for you? Didn't I tell you... That if you would stay faithful, then I will fight for you and I will move on your behalf. Didn't I tell you that nothing can separate you from my love? And 
do you believe it? I believe one of the things that God wants to do in our hearts is he wants to revive our faith. There's some of you walking around with a dead word that you've already put it in the grave and you look at it and it's like, by now, Lord, it stinks. The stench is too bad. And Jesus is saying, hey, roll away that stone. Roll away that stone of fear. Roll away that stone of confusion. Roll away that stone of doubt. Roll away that stone of religion that knows exactly what you're supposed to say. Do you trust me? Do you believe that even though it may seem like it's over, that if I'm around, there's always hope? It goes on in verse 41. It says they removed the stone. And then, I love this, because it says Jesus raised his eyes up and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me. But I'm saying this because of the people that are standing around me right now. So that they may believe that you sent me. Even though it seems like I'm four days late, God, I want them to know that I'm right in your timing. God, I want them to know that you have already heard me because this isn't the first time that I've talked to you about this situation. Because I've been listening for your voice. You were the one that told me to wait in the city. And I waited until you told me to come. And I told them what you told me to tell them, that, that their brother would raise again. And if they could believe that they would see the glory of God. I have done what you have told me to do. And now I am praying so that they know you sent me. And it says, when, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud, loud voice, Lazarus! It said it was a loud voice, not a quiet voice. <laughs> Some of y'all jumped. It didn't say he whispered, Lazarus. Said, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who was dead and wrapped hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was, was wrapped around with a cloth, and Jesus looked at him and said, Unbind him and let him go. I want you to notice some things here. Before the miracle happened, there was some work that had to take place. Because to roll away a stone wasn't like going out into the parking lot and rolling a little stone. Like, it was a big stone that was blocking a cave in the side of the wall. This took a little bit of effort, and it took a whole lot of faith. Because if you push this stone away, it's a lot of work to do just to smell a dead body that has been rotting for four days. See, here's the thing. The miracle didn't take place until they were obedient to do the work that God called them to do. And we can sit back and we can pray, oh God, send revival. But until God's people begin to do the work and push away the stone that has been holding people captive in prison, until we begin to do those things and breaking down barriers that the world has placed and that the church has placed around, until we begin to work it, we'll never see the resurrection. You can pray for revival all you want, but if you're not willing to work, You'll never see it. If you're not willing to fight in prayer, you'll never see it. If you're not willing to not just stay inside these walls and have prayer meetings, but go into dark places and begin to feed the poor and minister to the hurting people and minister to the drug addict and minister to those people, if you're not willing to get your hands dirty and get in a little bit of stench, you'll never see the revival that God's calling. All you'll do is feel good for a couple weeks from your emotional services 
and nothing changes. We're not talking about a little wake up and then fall back to sleep. We're talking about something that was dead and stinking and rotting and horrible being brought back to life. And Lazarus being able to have a future again. There are a lot of people that are in their tombs that are around us. And God has called us as a church to start to work. Go roll some stones. Go get your hands dirty. And for too long, we've sat inside these four walls praying for revival. And God said, no, 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 no. We need to go to the place where the dead are. We got to go to the tomb. You see, the, but he, he, he didn't just stay in Martha's house and say, okay, we're going to pray for Lazarus to come out. He said, no, 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 take me where you laid him. And he went to the place where the dead, rotting corpse was. He said, all right, show me you believe me by rolling this stone away. Listen, faith, true faith is messy. True faith is not neat and saying that you believe. Because Martha said, yeah, God, I believe that anything you ask for of God, that God will give it to you. But when Jesus said, your brother's going to live again, he was like, yeah, in the resurrection, he'll live. And too many Christians have been the exact same way. I want to bring revival. And we just think that it's going to take place inside the little house instead of in the place of the dead. Faith is, is risky. Because if you have to roll that stone away and you just smell that horrible stench for nothing, I mean, that's a bad day. You might have smell like a dead animal or something like that. Can you imagine a dead body that has been trapped in a cave and just marinating in there, heating up? For four days, how horrible that would be. But not only before was there work to be done, but after Jesus raised him from the dead, there was still work to be done. He looked at him and said, okay, now that I've raised him from the dead, you go unwrap him. You go unbind him and let him go. I'm just saying, if we truly want revival, it's going to take work on the front end. It's going to take us going to the place of death. And it's going to take work on the back end. Because scripture says, I think it's in Proverbs 14, it says, where there is no manger, or it, where, where there are no sheep or there are no oxen, the manger is clean. But you get a bunch of sheep in a manger, or you get a bunch of oxen in a manger, how many know it's not so clean in there? And it stinks because there's mess. And for too long, people in the church have not been willing to get messy. And God says, I can bring the dead things to life. But I'm just looking for some people who will push the stone away. And some people who will unwrap them. And get them moving in the right direction. Our state is not too far gone. Melody showed me a report. Brooke, you can come on up. Melody showed me a report the other day that now in Cabell County, we have one of the highest HIV outbreaks because man thought they had a good way of, here, let's just do a needle exchange and that'll cut down on passing disease and stuff through needles and all it did was they're not worried about hey is this a clean needle that I'm shooting up this era did, have you used this they're not worried about that right now and so they just keep going to that same needle and shooting up and now it's not just the high and everything but now their HIV outbreak and all of those things and all that is, is, you know, we went from a couple years ago where we were number one in drug overdose in the United States. 
Within six months, we made it to number one in drug overdose in the world. Now, we're one of the fastest growing HIV epidemics. And a lot of people would look at that and say, that's too much death, it's too far gone. That's four days in the tomb, it's over. But God is looking at us, saying, will you go with me to the place of death? Can, can I get some people who will start rolling away some stones? Because what everybody else calls death and hopeless, I call it asleep. And I can wake it up, and I can revive it. When I say revive weekend, I don't mean that revive stops on Sunday when John Bevere leaves. This is the beginning of us saying, you know what, we're not playing church anymore. We're not sitting inside these four walls anymore. We're not being number one in all the worst categories anymore. And I believe God can revive our state. I'll push a stone. See, here's the thing. It's easy to say it in here. And I'm just, I'm just going to be real honest, real quick. We shake our head and say, yes, we'll go push stones away in dark places. But we cancel every time we're supposed to usher inside the church in the sanctuary of God. We cancel all the time when we're supposed to teach children the Word of God or invest in children so that the parents can hear the Word of God because it's just too hard. And I'm not trying to be mean. But scripture says you have to understand what the cost of things are before you get out there and get involved in it. I'm telling you right now, what God is calling us as a church to do and the revival that God wants to bring as a church, we're not going to be able to do it if we can't even serve in God's house faithfully. If you cancel because it's raining outside in the parking lot, if you cancel because life's just too busy, you will never go push a stone of a grave away. This is the easy stuff in here, guys. This is the soft stuff. This is the weak Christianity. And in fact, in God's view, this is a church in a building isn't what he called the church to be. From the very birth of the church, it didn't take place inside the four walls. They met inside the four walls once a week to honor God that day. The rest of the time, they met in homes. They met in the streets. They met in the hedges and the highways. They were ministering to the lost. They were reaching poor and hurting people. They didn't stay in here. And we have taken our sabbatical and we have had our rest. And even with that, listen, a Sabbath was rest, not stoppage. I mean, Jesus even said, if you see a donkey in the ditch, don't you go get it out. Don't you lead your animals to the water to take care of them. Some of you have taken Sabbath as being, I ain't doing nothing for a year. Don't get mad at me. We can't be those people who put our hands to the plow and turn back. So when you sit there and nod your head and commit, yes, I want to be a part of this revival, you need to understand what you're getting into. Because the person who puts their hand to the plow is like, oh, it's too hard. Says they're not worthy of the kingdom of God. I'm not saying that that means you're going to go to hell and you lose your salvation. I'm not saying that. But I can tell you this, you will lose your reward in heaven if you don't engage in what God's called you to do. And I Heart Church has not been called to play church. 
Our Heart Church has not been called to draw crowds. Our Heart Church has been called to make disciples, to reach lost and hurting people, to find people who are far from God, and then let them encounter the love. That's the whole mission, to reflect God's love to a lost and dying. What better place than in the middle of the deadest graveyard in the nation? I mean, the darkest places is where when the light begins to shine, it makes the biggest impact. And God has called us to be a city on a hill, the light of the world. It cannot easily be hidden. That people see our good works and they give glory to God. That's what Jesus went to the cross for. Jesus didn't just go for forgiveness for your sins Jesus went for the stripper who's down there in southern exposure right now Jesus went for the heroin addict who just shot up Jesus went for the ones who are sitting in prison Jesus went for your ex-spouses let's get personal here Jesus went for child molesters and abusers He went to the cross for them. And what I see in this video, and we're going to do a night where we show you guys a video that we came across. I'll tell you what, it has wrecked me about this revival that's going on in Iran. Because within a couple years in people's life, they're, they're going from meth addict to running churches. They're going from prostitution and multiple suicide attempts and all of this stuff to leading discipleship groups and and raising and and pulling people out of Islam and and all this stuff. And if it can take place in in a country where Christianity can have you killed, don't you think it should easily be able to take place here? What's the difference? We play church, they're being the church. We're huddling in our nice air conditioned buildings and they're risking their lives to share the story of what Jesus did in theirs. That's who God's called us to be. God's called us not to have a revival, but to revive our state back to life. And it's up to us to answer that call. I told Summersville, I said, this stuff doesn't happen automatically. It takes every person saying, here I am, God, send me. Again, thanks so much for tuning in today. We hope that you've enjoyed this message and that you felt the presence of God right where you are. If you did enjoy it, we'd love to see you live at one of our campuses. Mount Hope meets at 9, 11, and 5, and Summersville meets at 11. We'll see you there.